MZ TV. No matter what movie you watch about the Passion of Christ or a play, any recording, any performance on the crucifixion of our Lord, without fail, when our Lord says those epic words, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit, without fail, every single writer and producer and director has our Lord saying it this way. <clears throat> Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. That's exactly how it's intoned. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. Almost like a statement of resignation. That's not how it was. Now, of course, I can't know this for sure, but if I were to write, produce, and direct The Passion of Christ, this is how our Lord would intone it. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Precisely like that. And I don't want you to miss the facial expression. Eyes to heaven, imploring, pleading. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Do you see the difference and do you appreciate the difference? Death is such a dread for humanity. And it was such a dread for Christ. The dread being that when you understand what death truly is, which is non-existence, and you hope to live again, suddenly there is a desperation for God to fulfill his promise of resurrection. Good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Zender, the world's most outspoken Bible scholar. This is MZ TV, broadcasting from the edge of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula in Fort Lauderdale. Welcome to the show. Death is the ultimate dread of humanity, so much so that the most popular false teaching, the most popular human philosophy that has come into the race is the immortality of the soul. Because when it comes right down to it, if death is truly non-existence, and scripture everywhere states that it is, then you have to depend on God to raise you from the dead. You have to depend on someone else. You can no longer do it yourself. And human beings love to be in control they're desperate for control. Human beings have this sick disposition to trust only themselves. I can handle this. I can do this. And if the soul truly is immortal, in other words, if there is no such thing as death, then you don't have to trust anyone outside of yourself to bring life because you have life existing already within yourself. It's innate, according to this satanic teaching, and it is satanic. And today, I'm going to look into Satan's motivation, because Satan is the one who introduced this false teaching into the human race. I want to look at Satan's motivation for introducing both the immortality of the soul and the Trinity into the human race race and for some reason i seem to be the only person who has asked this question what was satan's motivation we know about the doctrines of demons first timothy 4 1 speaks of the doctrines of demons certainly the trinity and the immortality of the soul are two of the premier doctrines 
of demons that Satan has injected into the human race via Christian councils. Ah, but no, it predates that because he introduced the doubt of death into the minds of the first couple in the garden. Did God really say to die, you shall be dying? Could it be that even at this early stage of the human race, Satan was looking forward to the death of Christ and the faith of Christ in handing over his future to God, to someone else, to someone beside himself. If anyone ever come to earth would have reason to be confident in himself, it would be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But even he had to give up all control. And this is the terror to the human race, giving up control to someone else. And I'm going to be honest with you, as I always am. You tell me if you haven't thought the same thing. We try to imagine what we would be thinking if we were faced with a deathbed situation. Knowing the truth about death, as we do, that it is non-existence. Is there not some little shadow of doubt, some little specter of fear that it will be the absolute end and that God maybe will not raise you from the dead? Maybe it's all a lie. Maybe it's all a trick. And there is... Because we're fallible human beings, there is that little shred, thread of doubt because we're giving up control. Our Lord was not a fallible human being, but even he, when he was committing his spirit to God, realized that if God did not raise him, if his father did not rouse him, from the dead, then he would never live again. And as I said, there came a time in my walk that I could not merely accept that these false teachings existed. And I would say the biggest false teachings injected into the human race by demonic spirits including Satan himself, are the immortality of the soul. This is related to the Trinity because it applies the immortality of the soul to Christ, free will, and eternal torment. I contend to you that Satan, even in the garden, was looking ahead was trying to inject the belief in the immortality of the soul so that human beings would not rely on God. But the most critical individual that Satan was worried about was Christ. And he knew how important the faith of Christ was for the salvation of the world. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are saved not by our own faith, but by the faith of Christ, not faith in Christ. We're not saved by faith in Christ. We're saved by the faith of Christ. And where does the faith of Christ enter into the scene, if not in giving up his life, consciously surrendering his existence and trusting i.e. having faith in his father to raise him from the dead. This is why, Father, into your hands I'm committing my spirit. You promised you would raise me after three days. I'm, I'm trusting you on that. And I'm letting go. 
And I propose to you that that was a fearful prospect, even for our Lord. Well, we see his humanity also in the Garden of, of, of Gethsemane. People can't believe that our Lord was looking th- or would consider, would hope for, is praying for a plan B. I've said that for years, that his agony in the garden was real. And he didn't want to go to the cross. People argue with me, say, and they say, well, obviously he knows the plan. He knows what he has to do. Yes, yes, that's all true. But in his humanity... He literally thought that there could possibly be another way to do it. He didn't doubt that he was the channel of salvation to all humanity and to the entire creation for that matter. He knew that he was the last Adam, that he would undo the work of the first Adam in condemning the entire human race. Of course, he knew that. But couldn't there be another way to do it besides this? In his humanity... He was asking, begging God, begging his father for a plan B. And so in the crisis at the cross, at the moment of his letting go, I see a similar manifestation of his humanity and that he hopes and prays that God will raise him from the dead. Because again, if God doesn't, do it, then he never lives again, and neither do any of us. What is a foundational belief that belongs to membership in the body of Christ? Paul lays it out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, is belief in the death of Christ for sin. The purpose of his death for sin, to take away the sin of the world. That's a, another matter. I'm not here to talk about human free will today because, as you know, human free will derails Christ's death for sin. But I'm speaking now of his death. The whole creation lies in Christ's faith. And any good translation, for instance, in Romans 3, 21 and 22, speaking of the faith of Christ, many translations botch that and they talk about faith in Christ. But the proper translation, and it's more than one place, speaks of the faith of Christ, that the faith of Christ is what saves us. It was his action at the cross and giving up his life, trusting his father. Boom, that's it. Listen, God loves to be believed because It is belief that overcomes the doubt in the garden. God was not believed. Eve did not believe God. She came to doubt God. She wanted to live forever. She wanted to eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of life because then she and her husband Adam would not have to trust God. This whole thing comes down to trusting God, to believing God. And God loves to be believed above all else. In spite of the most harrowing situation, namely non-existence, because that's what death is, non-existence. The realization of what death was, was the hardest thing for me to come to. It was easier for me to believe in the salvation of all. It was easier for me to believe that my will was not free and that it was God operating in me constantly to will and to work for the sake of his delight. But when it came down to death, that common human dread came upon me and I did not want to believe that I actually would be letting go of my life, falling into oblivion, falling into non-existence and having to trust another to raise me from the dead. That's the crux of everything. And this is why a belief in the death of Christ, his faith in going into death, and that's where his faith is centered. His faith is centered in going into death. 
Of course, a related faith is that he goes to the death of the cross, not only death, but death of the most horrible sort. That because of his suffering, he would undo the acts of Adam and the acts of Satan. It required sacrifice and suffering. So that explains the agony of the cross. But the state of death is the ultimate humiliation, it's the ultimate dread of the human race. No wonder it's so easy for people to believe in the immortality of the soul. I believe that Satan was looking forward, not in an anticipatory way, but looking forward in a strategic way to Christ knowing that everything would ride on trust in the face of death. And knowing that Christ would come. Now, I, I don't know how smart exactly Satan is. I don't know how smart he is in, in relation to looking ahead, in relation to knowing the future. But I think he knew how important it was to introduce this doubt concerning death. And that happened in the garden. But now... We come to the year 300, 300 years approximately after the death of Christ, and the doctrine of the Trinity is injected into the human race by Satan via the Council of Nicaea, making the Trinity, that is, that Jesus Christ is God, a foundational teaching of the Christian religion, so much so that if you don't believe in the Trinity, they would say, you're not God's. The irony here is that if you do believe in the Trinity, <laughs> you're not God's. That is, as touching membership in the body of Christ. Why is Satan so concerned about membership in the body of Christ? Because it is the destiny of members of the body of Christ to usurp Satan's place. And where is Satan right now? He is in the celestial realms. He is the chief of the jurisdiction of the air. That is his realm. That is his place of influence. He's not as concerned about Israel because Israel will inherit the earth, the ground, the terra firma. Satan, again, is in the celestial realms, not on the earth. That's where he holds sway and has held sway. Not absolutely, of course, but in accord with the jurisdiction given him by God in order to be an enemy And Satan does not want to surrender his sovereignty to any other people, certainly not these lowly creatures crawling upon the earth known as the human race. Doesn't want that. And so he is going to do everything in his power to keep that from happening. And I think knowing ahead of time of how critical the death of Christ would be, he immediately injects false teachings for people to believe the false teaching that would thereby disqualify them from believing in the death of Christ. The Trinity states that Jesus Christ is God. Can God die? No. Therefore, Jesus Christ did not die, according to the teaching. And no one in the Christian religion believes that Jesus Christ died. Therefore, are they not all disqualified from being members of the body of Christ? Yes, the obvious answer is yes. But for years, I read literature, including from the Concordant Publishing Concern, that said, well, you can believe in the Trinity and believe in the death of Christ. It's no problem. There's no conflict there. And I said, what? Because I was a snot-nosed kid, kind of like the same kind of kid that looked at the emperor and said, hey, the emperor has no clothes. I said, well, wait a minute. How can belief in the non-death of Christ be the same as the death of Christ? How can we say that believing in the death of Christ is essential for membership in the body of Christ, but you can also believe that Jesus Christ didn't die, and it's the same? No problem. What? The emperor's naked. Everybody acknowledged that these false teachings existed. But for some reason, I was the only person that asked the question, why do they exist? What's the motive? We know that they're doctrines of demons, but what's the motive behind it? Not to toot my own horn here, but uh, toot, toot, toot. 
it seemed like the obvious question to me that everyone was ignoring. And even A.E. Nock, who translated the concordant version, would say things like, well, yeah, the Trinity is a bad teaching, free will is a bad teaching, but none of these things are roadblocks to believing in Christ. And my question was, well, why did these teachings exist in the first place? They're so big. They're so all-pervasive. What's the motivation? And then I saw it. Wow, the motivation is to prevent people from being in the body of Christ. And I was so heartened, again, to see Jess's video, which I shared with you yesterday. When she looks at the camera and says, believing in the Trinity, that is, that Jesus Christ is God, and thus, by extension, believing that Jesus could not die because God could not die, and therefore Jesus did not die. That does not belong to membership in the body of Christ. Those who believe that are disqualified from members of the body of Christ. When I first started saying these things in, two, in the year 2000, I was lambasted by everybody. Because it seemed unfair that one little teaching could disqualify people. And people were saying of me, well, Martin Zender is saying that you have to believe certain things in order to be saved. He's making salvation a matter of works. The works being that you have to believe the right thing. And I said, no, you got it all backwards. It's not that you, ha you have to believe the right thing to be in the body of Christ. It's that those who are designated beforehand to be members of the body of Christ will believe the right thing. The pre-designation comes first, and the proper belief comes later. There's a difference between believing truth and believing lies. I just, I'm a black and white person that way. Black and white. Either you believe the truth or you don't believe the truth, and it makes a difference. This was not popular. In the ensuing years, it has caught on, and people are listening to the to the kid who says the emperor has no clothes and they're all saying, yeah, you're right. You know, the emperor doesn't have any clothes and any teaching that says teaching doesn't matter. And this is all over the place now. Even Clyde Pilkington says teaching doesn't matter that much. Even A. E. Nock said teaching doesn't matter that much. It's not about the teaching. It's just that we all fellowship together and have a nice time and get along and we all have pure hearts and that this guy would say that, oh, no, 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 no. It matters what you believe. It just seems so non-inclusive. Martin, you have to include everybody. You're making it too hard. This is what Jerry Boschman said publicly in Sacramento, California, 10, 15 years ago. When I taught on these things, when I taught of the diabolical, nature of the immortality of the soul and the trinity he flipped jerry boschman did now listen this guy wrote a great book called hope beyond hell and he's helped many people to see the falsehood of eternal torment i thank god for that but he and i were teaching at the same conference in sacramento back in the day and he was appalled that i would teach that a belief in the Trinity disqualifies people. Or I should say that a belief in the Trinity would be evidence that someone was not designated beforehand to believe the truth. And he got up publicly and said, Martin Sanders making it too hard. I'm sorry, but he sounds like Woody Allen when he talks. It's charming. I love it. Love to hear the guy talk. But he was incensed. Why? Because his brother, who he loved dearly, believed in the Trinity, and he could not believe that someone who believed in the Trinity would not be in the body of Christ because we were talking about someone near and dear to him. And Jerry Boschman said from the podium, my brother prays three times a day. He does this, he does that. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can't look at individuals here. You can't be swayed by emotions. You have to judge strictly, black and whitely, by the truth, by the teaching that belongs to membership in the body of Christ. And I did not invent the teaching that belongs to membership in the body of Christ. Neither did the apostle Paul invent it. He just communicated it. God sent it down 
through his son, Jesus Christ, that the death of Christ, the faith of Christ to let go and trust that his God would raise him, it's essential. That's the crux of everything. And there's no excuse, relatively speaking, not to believe in the death of Christ. For that matter, there's no excuse not to believe in what death is because Scripture states it many places. The dead do not know anything. The dead do not live. It is important to believe the truth. It is important to suss out why Satan would inject this. What's his motive? What's his motive? His motive is to keep as many people as he can from believing in the death of Christ and therefore from becoming members of the body of Christ because we will displace him. We will usurp his power among the celestials. He doesn't want that. And so he puts a tripwire before every essential element, two main elements, the death of Christ and the death of Christ for sin. And I'm here to expose it boldly and to say that believing truth matters. And believing truth is not the same as believing lies.